Say, I'm going to live a spirit-led life. Now, you know, there's one thing I love about our church. Well, there's lots of things I love about our church. But specifically, we put an emphasis on being filled with the Holy Spirit. We believe that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But can I tell you something? Another thing that we put a big emphasis on is not just being filled with the Holy Spirit, but being led by the Holy Spirit. And we're starting a brand new series called The Journey. And we're going to be looking at the four missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. We're going to go through great detail. And it's going to be different than kind of what some of the things that we've done in the past Because we're going to do a lot of scripture and go through the step-by-step journey of Paul the Apostle. It's going to be amazing. How many of you guys want to know the journeys of Paul the Apostle? But can I tell you why we're doing this? Because I truly believe that those four missionary journeys that Paul the Apostle took epitomizes, truly epitomizes what it means to have a spirit-led life. A spirit-led life. You're going to see moments, even this morning, where Paul the Apostle is headed in one direction and The next direction he goes makes absolutely no sense in the natural, but the Holy Spirit led him. And so this morning, I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 13 as we jump into the word, Acts chapter 13. And we're going to take a look at the very first moment here that Paul the Apostle is commissioned. Acts chapter 13 verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Salatius and sailed from there to Cyprus. Let's pray. Father, I pray. Let our ears be open. Lord, let your word be a lamp upon our feet and a light upon our path. We thank you, Lord God, for your word that changes us. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen and amen. This morning, I want to welcome, we've got Kawhi joining us this morning. Come on, everybody, give it up for Kawhi. We've got Kula. Kula is joining us this morning. And, and guess what? Oahu is joining us this morning. Can I just, I miss you, Oahu. I love you guys. I love you so much. Wish I was there in the flesh, but for this week, this is going to have to do, I'll see you next week. I'll be there. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. But we love you guys so much. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited to have you here with us. The title of my message, if you're taking notes this morning, the title of my message is Led Through Opposition. Led Through Opposition. What God calls you to, he will see you through. What he calls you to, he will help you through. He will lead you through. He doesn't leave you or forsake you. God's not intimidated by your opposition. God's not intimidated by the circumstances and the situations that you face. Can I tell you, there are many, many times we become intimidated, we become fearful by the situations that we face. But I got good news for you. If God be for you, who can be against you? He's not going to abandon you in the midst of the storm. He's not going to abandon you in the midst of your opposition. But this is something that we have to make clear this morning. Just because you're facing opposition doesn't mean it's not God. Too often as believers, we think the moment we hit opposition or the moment we face trials or the moment we go through a storm, obviously this isn't the will of God. The only problem with that mindset is we see here as Paul the Apostle and Barnabas, as they begin to travel, they face opposition almost immediately. Can you imagine If Paul and Barnabas would have adopted that mindset that opposition means it's not God, trials and issues and storms 
mean it's not God? But you see, he understood. He understood a very simple principle. That what God calls you to, he leads you through. That what God calls you to, he leads you through. That God was there in the midst of the opposition. That God was working in the midst of the opposition. So if you get anything, Kauai, Oahu, Kula, Maui, Kahului, if you get anything this morning, I want you to leave here with a confidence going, if God called me to it, he's going to lead me through it. I want us to take a look at Paul's very first missionary journey. And you see here on the wall, go ahead and put that. If you guys want to put it up at the top, you can as well. But behind me, you see Paul's very, very first missionary journey. It's a very unique journey. It, it happened around, it was about a two-year length. Many theologians believe it was about a two-year length. And the reason why I think that's important is because as you see his journey, it wasn't just this quick shot. He had committed his life to this journey. So however long it takes, I'm going to commit myself to the journey. Isn't it interesting how a lot of times we give God a time limit? Say, God, you can do this in me and through me, but it needs to be this long or it needs to happen here and now. And we put time restraints on God. But to me, the reason why this is so important to understand is because Paul said, I'm committed to the journey you have for me. No, no matter how long it takes, I'm going to get this done. And so we see this happening around 46 to 48 A.D. And we see his journey in a very unusual way. And I want you to see this as you see right there, the blue line on the wall represents the beginning of his journey. And we see him take off from Antioch. We see him take off to Antioch and head to Cyprus and then to Perga. And then we see a moving around all the way through Lystria. You guys can't see that because of, of the way the wall is. And then he comes back and he returns to Antioch. But there's a few things that I want us to see because his journey was marked by some real significant events. And we're going to see as we walk through this, the opposition that he faced, but the miracles. Now, I, you need to hear this. The oppositions he faced, but the miracles that God manifested. You know, you're going to have to make a choice. In your journeys of life, the oppositions you face, you're going to have to make a decision on what you're going to focus on. Are you going to focus on the opposition or are you going to focus on the miracle? Are you going to focus on the hardship or are you going to focus on the harvest? And I believe if we can change our mindset and start focusing on the miracles that God's doing and the harvest that God is providing, can I tell you, all the suffering, all the trial and opposition, it's worth it. Because I'm going to fix my eyes on those things. Now, I want to deal with this. The first thing that we see here, and I don't know if any of you, any, any of you notice this, but first of all, all the people there that we see that were with Paul, the apostle, Simeon, Niger, um, Lucius, and, and um, Manan, all these guys are studs. Can I tell you, they are hardcore. They weren't just chumps. They weren't novice within scripture. These guys were amazing men of God. But when I look at this, I go, why Paul and Barnabas? Like in comparison to these guys, Paul was nothing. But why Paul and Barnabas? It was because of God. God has a plan. And can I tell you, the plans of God sometimes don't make sense to men. And too often we discount that which God is doing in someone else because it doesn't make sense. Or we discount what God is doing in someone else because of our own entitlement issues. Jealousy. They could have very easily discounted Paul and said, I should be the one going. I've done more miracles than Paul. I've preached more sermons than Paul and Barnabas. I've seen more miracles. And then there's this comparison thing going on. Who gets to go on this journey? Who's going to get sent out? And the worst thing is our jealousy, our entitlement, our comparison contend against the call and the purposes of God. 
our own prejudice. They could have very easily thrown out the, uh, uh, excuse me, Christian killer. You, you're telling me you're going to send out a Christian killer on this journey? Isn't it interesting? So often, we try and discount on people's lives. Hmm. We try and discount the call of God because of our own inadequacies. Can I tell you what I love about this group? They wouldn't allow it to happen. I love, what, what was their first response? They fasted and prayed. What did they do? They said, we're not going to allow the flesh to make this decision. We're going to fast and we're going to pray and we're going to seek God to make sure we're sending out the right people. And after they fasted and prayed, what happened? God put his finger on Paul and Barnabas and sent them out. They became anointed and appointed. Come on, somebody say it with me. I'm anointed. Come on, get your finger, put it right in your chest. Say, I'm anointed and I am appointed. And this is what I love about this situation. The whole group was led by the Holy Spirit. They were all in one accord in this. They were all led and yielded to the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit. They didn't allow jealousy and entitlement to stop them and derail the plan and the call of God. Can I encourage you, church? I'm talking, I'm talking to kings worldwide. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't allow your entitlement issues, your jealousy issues to hinder other people from stepping into what God has. You know why? There may be a Paul in this church that instead of, now, now, hear me, please. I know sometimes we all look for the glamour and the glitz and the glory, but God may want to raise up a Paul right beside you and you got to have a heart you got to have a heart for people because you have a heart for the kingdom of God and the moment you make the kingdom of God all about you it ceases to be about him I love how these men were willing to step out of the way to say we'll we'll allow this ex-christian killer Guy that's not really, really, truly, I, I don't know. We're going to allow him to step into his God-given purpose. Can you imagine if we as a church have that heart? You know, I believe we do. I believe that's why we have over 100, 400, sorry, 400 churches globally right now. But we have to maintain that heart. Paul and Barnabas begin their journey, and we see in Acts chapter 13, verse 5, turn with me there, in Acts chapter 13, verse 5, when they arrived, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was, who was an intendant of the proconsul. And I want to stop here for a moment. In a very interesting moment here, they encounter this guy, Bar Jesus, and he tries to oppose the word of God from coming forth. He is in opposition against him right off the bat. Are you seeing this? Right off the bat, they meet this guy, Bar Jesus, in total opposition. But what is Paul's response? He could have said, oh, well, you know what? This must, be, this must not be God. This obviously isn't God. We're going to go somewhere else. He stands in the authority. Everybody say authority. authority. Come on, say authority. authority. He walks in the authority of God and he rebukes him. And in that moment, God does a miracle and turns the whole thing around. In one moment, God gave Paul audience with the proconsul. That's amazing. I want you to think about that. In one moment, he operates in the authority of Christ. Can I tell you something? Your opposition is nothing in comparison to the authority of Christ on your life. 
You got to get that in your spirit. Not your authority, not how awesome you are, not how much you know, but the authority of Jesus Christ operating in and through you. Paul walked in the authority of Jesus. When opposition comes, you've got to step into authority. When the devil comes in against you, you got to step in the authority. Excuse me, devil. This ain't going down. You're not going to hinder me. I'm not backing down. I know what God called me to. See, if you're not convinced of the call, any bit of opposition will derail you. If you ain't convinced of the call, every opposition will derail you. But when you know that you know that you're called and you're anointed and you're appointed by God, can I tell you, something begins to shift. Because in that moment you go, you know what, I got to step in the authority that God has for me. And so in that moment, I love it, Paul steps into the authority of God. And we see that in that, <laughs> Bar Jesus becomes blind. God silences the attempt of the enemy to derail the gospel from going forth. And this is what was amazing. When the pro at the very end of this, and the pro saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. You know what I love about Paul? Paul was willing to do whatever the situation demanded. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to give up. Do you know why we have a church building like this on an island of Maui? It's because we have a global senior pastor that says, I won't back down. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to work as hard as I can because this is about souls. This is not about making a, 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 a church that glorifies man, but glorifies God. We have to fight. Many of you remember the early days and all the spiritual warfare that we had to face. Dr. Morocco is going to be preaching Wednesday night. He's going to be talking about the victory, the spiritual warfare. How many of you guys want some victory in spiritual warfare? <sighs> but can I tell you, this false prophet comes and sought to persuade the proconsul a different way. But the Holy Spirit came upon Paul. He walked in the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. Friends, we've got to walk in the authority of Christ. But the second thing that we see, the second opposition, the second challenge that we see that Paul and Barnabas face is here's John, John Mark. And uh, there's a transition that happened. We see this is a very unusual thing that happens in Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Turn with me there. Acts chapter 13, verse 13. See if you can throw it up there on the wall. We see something interesting. From Paphos, after this whole thing happens, Paul steps in the authority which God gave him. From Paphos, Paul and his companions, excuse me? What did you just call me? You just call me a companion? Excuse me, I am Barnabas. I started this thing. There is a transition of leadership. And you know what was amazing in that moment? Barnabas didn't get offended by it. He'd be like, Psh, Paul, who do you think you are, man? I'm the one. You remember, I was the one that went to Tarsus and found you out and brought you to Antioch. And now it's all about you? There's a shift in ministry. But see, Barnabas means son of encouragement. He understood his role to encourage the anointing and the call. Friends, are you encouraging people around you to step into the fullness that God has for them? Can I ask you a question? What if God called you to be an encourager? Yes. Instead of being in the spotlight or the limelight, you were the encourager. Barnabas could care less, but what was interesting is many theologians believe there's one of two things that could have happened because we see, so they sailed on where John left them to return to Jerusalem from Perga. They went to beside Antioch. What happened? John abandoned them. 
Now we know it was abandonment because Paul talks about it in Acts chapter 15, verse 38, but Paul did not think because they wanted to bring John Mark with them back on the journey. But in Acts 15, 38, it says, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted or abandoned them. So John Mark actually abandons Paul and Barnabas. And many theologians say there's one of two things that could have happened. Either he, the situation that took place with Bar Jesus and seeing all that craziness freaked John Mark out. The opposition, the persecution, the trial, all that freaked him out. He's like, I don't know if I, I, I want anything to do with it. This is hard. Or he was offended by the transition of power. We don't know. Can I ask you a real quick question? I want you to just ponder on this. Are we prone to abandon that which God's called us to because of things that we haven't dealt with internally? Did you know even as a pastor, there are things that I abandon, call specific things that I knew God called me to, but because I had inner turmoil, because of fear, Hmm. things that I had, I was not willing to deal with. You know what took place? Because of those things, they became, they became the issue of my life that caused a derailment in that which God had called me to. And the worst part is, I actually felt justified in stepping out of the call and stopping and leaving the direction and the call God had for me because I felt justified in what I was feeling. John abandoned them. I don't know if you've ever felt this. I don't know if any of you have ever felt abandonment. But what's amazing about Paul and Barnabas is they didn't allow it to stop them. They said, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. We're going to push forward. I'm not going to allow this to derail us and stop us. Friends, I know that there are going to be people that will disappoint you in your journey. Somebody here needs to hear this this morning. There will be people that will disappoint you on your journey. Don't allow the failures, the frustrations of others to stop you in the call and the destiny of your life. I've had people that say, well, pastor, nobody wants to come to my life group anymore. I used to have a big life group and they're not coming anymore. I, I think I'm going to stop doing life group. Why? Don't you feel called to this? Pastor, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop doing ministry because nobody's coming anymore. Why? Don't you feel called to it? You see, people's attendance don't affect or impact my call. Wow. I'm going to do and I'm going to be who God's called me to be no matter whether you come along or not. Oh, it got real quiet in here. I'm going to be and I'm going to do what God's called me to do and who he's called me to be, whether you come along for the journey or not. But if I'm waiting, if I'm waiting to step into the fullness of what God has for me based upon the attendance of this church, I'm going to miss out. Based, along, based upon who comes along with me, look, I'm going to take responsibility for my call and myself and I'm going to move forward in my destiny and my purpose and whether people come along or not and I want people to join me but man if people disappoint me if people abandon me along the call they ain't going to stop me I'm going to keep moving forward in my call and my destiny we see this this the third thing that happens this one this one's the big one everybody say the crowd now in Lystra, this is a very interesting thing and I'm just gonna summarize this because it's, it's, it's I don't wanna have to read through the whole thing because it takes a little long, but as I summarize this, what happens is Paul and Barnabas, they walk into Lystra and they see this incredible miracle. And it's an amazing thing that God does and he, <laughs> he, he sees this miracle and heals this man and all of a sudden all these people come around and they start worshiping Paul and Barnabas like they're gods. They actually call Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes. Now, I, I, don't, know, I don't know about you, but if somebody started worshiping you, you'd be like, you the man. <laughs> you'd be like, that's right. <laughs> that's. So here they are, they're worshiping, but this is what happened. Opposition came and some Jews came in from the circumcision group 
and turned the crowd, the very people that were about to sacrifice to worship them, turned on them. And in one moment, they beat him up. And many theologians believe that they beat Paul until he died. They stoned him to death. We see Paul face this situation. He's trying his best. He's trying his best to convince him, look, I'm not a God. I'm, I'm not anything special. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And the very crowd that was worshiping them turned on them. Can I tell you something? Some of your greatest fans will become some of your greatest critics. And I've seen people turn on me in one moment. I've had people come up to me, oh, pastor, you are the greatest preacher on planet earth. I never see them again. I've had people in my face tell me that I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread, but on Facebook and Instagram, they hate my stinking guts. I'm the scum between their toes. I'm not doing this for them. I'm not doing this for their approval. I'm doing this for Jesus. Now, this is what's crazy. They kill him. The Bible says that all the people gather around them, raise him up, and he goes to the next city. In the next city, he has a massive, massive revival. We're looking at, so here he is now, and he stays at Derby for a while. But then he says something crazy. Now, I want you guys to look at this map. I want you to see this map. Put that map back up. Oh, there it is up top there. You guys see where Derby is at the very, very, it's where the red and the, the blue meet. You guys see that? To the right of that is a place called Tarsus. Anybody know where Paul the Apostle is from? Tarsus. When Barnabas found him, he found him in Tarsus. So we know that he didn't have any issues in Tarsus. Tarsus could have been a sanctuary for him. I don't know about you, but if I would have had a trip like that, following the blue lines, if I would have had a trip like that and I ended up in Derby and I was just a walk away and I already walked, come that far, I'd go to Tarsus, I'd go on vacation. Anybody with me? Come on, Jesus. I would try and find solitude at home. I would go <laughs> get healed up because I just got done getting beat up in Lystra. But he does something crazy. Look at his journey. He turns around and he goes back to the, from Derby, he goes back to the very city that stoned him to death. And he goes back and he takes a journey all the way back around he finds himself at Italia and then he goes back to Antioch so why in the world would Paul do that can I just can I tell you what I'm convinced of why he returned the way he did as I close pastor grace if you'll come Paul and Barnabas retrace their steps and I believe it was because Paul was so passionate about the church that he wanted to strengthen the church. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. What was that about? As, as he traveled back he came back to a city in a town where the people that he had left there the people that he had poured into what did he do in that moment can i tell you what what paul did as he poured into them he established a strength and he and he exemplified what it was to be steadfast he exemplified what it was to face opposition and go through opposition not to be derailed by it and so he goes back and all of a sudden the people in that church are like hey paul we got to tell you something we got a revelation that we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of god because we won't be derailed, we're not gonna back down. And if it means having to go through hell in order to bring people heaven, we're gonna do it. Because that's what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. Sometimes suffering's gonna be a part of it. 
But along every journey, along every bit of suffering, guess what? There are miracles that will be demonstrated. There's provision that will come. There's healing that will be released. And in every city and in every town that Paul went to, can I tell you, the dead were being raised. People were being healed. The lame were walking. People were being delivered. And Paul says the opposition and the persecution and the trial is way worth it. Friends, we got to, the church has got to get back to the place that we understand the power of the call and what God is calling us to in this journey. I'm so comfortable and complacent. I'm so comfortable and complacent. See, Paul had a passion for discipleship. He desired to strengthen, even though it was inconvenient, even though there was possible confrontations. He didn't know what to expect when he got back into Lystra. But can you imagine how encouraged he was when he came to every city and every town? Some of them he got kicked out of, some of them he got rejected, and some of them he got killed in to see a thriving church, a growing church. And he saw his role, not just to preach, but to strengthen. Friends, I'm all about street evangelism. I'm about to say something that might make people mad at me. I'm all about street evangelism, and I believe we need to get out into the highways, byways. We need to preach the gospel. We've got to. We're starting a whole nother branch in this church. One thing I love about this church is that we've elevated pastors and ministers and teachers and prophets. We're starting a whole branch of ministry to elevate the evangelists in this house. But every person in here should be an evangelist. But we also have to exemplify in our lives what Paul showed us. He says, I'm not just interested in going in, blowing up and blowing out. He says, I'm concerned about discipleship. I'm not just going to go stand on the streets of Front Street and preach the gospel. And if someone says a sinner's prayer and they leave, it's fine. I don't give a rip. So I want to follow up. I want to disciple. If I'm going to go into a city and have a revival, I'm going to go and I'm going to follow up. And I'm going to disciple. That has to become our heart. We've got to disciple people. We've got to strengthen one another. He was committed to the call of God. And I love this attitude. It wasn't what was best for him, but rather for the church. I'm going to say that phrase and I'm going to close with that phrase. Paul lived a life that says, it's not about what's best for me. It's about what's best for the church. Can I tell you something? I just got to brag on KC for a while. Can I brag on KC for a little bit? I've seen exemplified in this church, here on Maui, in Kauai, on Oahu. I've seen it exemplified in this house. People that said, Pastor, it's not about my comfort. It's about the kingdom of God. And you've given like it was about the kingdom of God. You've served like it was about the kingdom of God. You loved like it was about the kingdom of God. But friends, we can't quit. We can't get comfortable and complacent because there's still more souls to be saved. There's still more people to be healed. There's still more people that need to be discipled and need to be raised up. There are still some Pauls in the waiting, waiting for a Barnabas to arise to say, hey, we're going to pick you up, man of God. I know you just went through a season of suffering. I know you just went through a season of hurt and pain and dysfunction, but there's a mighty call on your life. We need to be that church that makes the church more important than our comfort. Why? Because this is God's plan. 